Good morning. Welcome to Thrive Church. We are so glad to see you all on this beautiful Palm Sunday uh, morning. And uh, if you're here with us for the first time, we welcome you here to Thrive Church. I know we've been talking for months, months, and months now. Uh, building, and I'm happy to say we finally closed on the building. So, so yeah, I am. Uh, I'm so happy. Uh, we, we started looking at this building back. I think it was the end of June. Uh, of uh, last year, and we just closed on it on Friday, so it's finally ours, and now, now, uh, don't get too excited, because now is when the work starts, you know, so um, we're going to be having some, like, work days and different things, if anybody is interested in getting involved with that, uh, we'll keep you posted as, uh, as time progresses, but, uh, but I am, I'm excited that we'll finally have a, have a place to call our, our own. And, uh, and it's great because the, the building borders state land. There's hiking trails out there. There's all kinds of cool stuff that we'll be able to do. And uh, it'll just be a, be a great thing for us. So anyhow, um, we are in the final, uh, final week of our series called Start. So we're finally going to land this plane. And we've been talking about what it means to, uh, to start your faith over again. You know, a- a- as an adult, as a teenager, sometimes we begin to think that, that the faith that we grew up with as a kid no longer really relates to us now that, we're, now that we're adults or now that we're teenagers or now that we're more mature. I've met so many people in the course of the years in, in ministry and they, and they went to church and and, and they had a certain, you know, requirement to fulfill, maybe a confirmation or something like that. And, and, and the parents were like, okay, once you do that, you, it's up to you what you want to do. And they do that, and then, man, we're gone out of there. It's like, man, this doesn't relate. And, and, and we feel like sometimes our faith just doesn't really apply to the struggles and the difficulties we face as teens and young adults and as adults. So we've been looking at different things, and, and we started out... By, uh, by, you know, in the very beginning, looking at, at, at sin and about uh, what it takes to believe in God and faith. And we've looked at a lot of things, but we're going to look at something today. It was something that actually happened and actually something that is actually happening. And, and this is something that we really need to understand in order to fully embrace Christianity, in order to fully embrace Christ and the work that he's doing, we need to understand this because it's foundational to our faith. And and, and there's really no way to explain this phenomenon that I'm going to talk about. There's no way to explain it unless if Jesus is actually alive. If Jesus died in the grave, then, then this whole concept would be irrelevant. And Matthew, in the book of Matthew, he tells us a story. And in this story, Jesus and his disciples are traveling. They're going to Caesarea Philippi. Now, this was a city that was over 100 miles away from Jerusalem, okay? And they're traveling there on foot, as far as we know. So it's probably a several-day journey. They're on their way to Caesarea Philippi, 100 miles. That's like if we said right now, you know what, guys? Let's go to New York City, and we're going to walk there, okay? So, I mean, you can imagine this is a long journey that they're making. It's not long in a car, but it's long if you're doing it on foot. And so they're out there. Going to Caesarea Philippi. Now, Caesarea Philippi was a city that was run by Philip II. Now, just a little bit of history information for those of you that maybe know something about the Bible. If if you don't know much about the history of the Bible, just bear with me for a moment. Philip II was married to Salome, who was the daughter that actually danced before her mother and father when John the Baptist's head was cut off. Some of you might remember that. Well, this daughter was married to Philip II, who Philip II was the ruler over Caesarea Philippi, hence the name Philippi, which was, comes from his name, Philip. Well, Caesarea was the name that they give, had given it, to, uh, given it to, to honor Caesar Augustus. Caesar Augustus was the very first... Uh, emperor of the Roman Empire. He is considered the founder of the Roman Empire. And and he was the son of um, uh, Julius Caesar. 
or actually he was the adopted son of Julius Caesar. And, and he was thought of almost like a god. Like that's how they revered these emperors here. So here they're going into this city, Caesarea Philippi, ruled by the Roman government, named after Augustus Caesar, who was the first emperor, this godlike figure. And they're going in there, and, and here it says in Matthew 16, starting in verse 13. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Who do they say that I am? And it's interesting because, again, here we're going into this city with all these self-proclaimed godlike figures. You know, you got Philip, who's ruling the place, and Caesar, Augustus, and and all these different uh, emperors and rulers in the Roman Empire that were, were jockeying for this deity role. And Jesus is saying, who do, you, who do people say that I am? And, and in verse 14, it says, well, they replied, some people say you're John the Baptist. Now remember, they're going into the city where, where the ruler's wife is the one responsible for the death of John the Baptist. So some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. And others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But then he asked them. See, first he asked the question, who do they say I am? And they say all these things. And then he says, but who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? And we've talked about this a couple of times in this series, how you know, a lot of people may, may try to base their faith simply on, oh, this is what the Bible says, or this is the, what, what's historical. But really what our faith comes down to is this question. Who do you say that I am? Jesus is asking each of us, who do you say that I am? And some people say, oh, you, he was a great prophet. In fact, all the world religions kind of you know, uh, elevate Jesus to the role of a great prophet. Who do you say that I am? And in verse 16, Simon Peter, he answers this. He says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you're blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. As in, bingo, God told you that. You're not smart enough to come up with that on your own. You're not smart enough to figure that out. God showed you that. He says, yeah, yeah, you're right. And in a way, this is kind of a, you know, if we were in that conversation, it could kind of seem a little egotistical, Right? I mean, he said, so you're the son of God. You're the Messiah. And he's like, yep, bingo, you got it. But then Jesus goes on in verse 18 to make a prediction. He, he, he makes this prediction about something that's going to happen in the future. And he says, now I say to you that you're Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And all the powers of heaven will not conquer it. Now, people argue about what that word rock means. Does that mean Peter? Does that mean the Messiah? You know, really, at the end of the day, that's not what's significant about this. What's significant is about what Jesus is talking here, saying, I will build my church, and the gates of hell won't conquer it. The powers of hell won't conquer it. Well, that word, uh, it's in your notes, that word church comes from the Greek word ecclesia. Okay, guys, say that with me. Ecclesia. Ecclesia, okay? It's, we don't use this word, but it's, it's there. That's what, the, that's what the Greek word was. And this is what that word means. It means a gathering, write that down, a gathering of citizens called out from their homes into a public space, an assembly or congregation. So this word actually meant to call out into a public place. Place. So if they were going to have a big, you know, a big, you know, hearing out in the streets, they would call people out from their homes and they would go out and they would gather in the streets. So here in the middle of nowhere, Jesus is traveling with his disciples. They're going along to Caesarea Philippi. They're actually outlaws. In fact, they, they're afraid, not Jesus, but the disciples are afraid to even go back to Jerusalem because they know if they go to Jerusalem, they're dead meat. 
Okay, so, so here they are out there, afraid of everything, and Jesus says, guys, I'm going to build a gathering. I'm going to build a, a congregation. I'm going to build a group of people. Now, the problem is this, is there's this tragedy that happened when people translated the Bible from the original languages into English. Because, because there's a couple ways that they would translate the Bible. Usually, what they would do is they would find an equivalent word in the English language and, and, and swap that out. Sometimes, they would actually take the Greek word and try to spell it in English. Like, like baptism is like that. You know, it comes from the Greek word baptizo. So they try to like say, okay, how can we say this in English? This word, though, church, has nothing to do with ecclesia. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. In fact, this word church was taken from a German word, which was taken from another Greek word, and it doesn't mean gathering. It means, you have it in your notes, church is house of the Lord. House of the Lord. It's a building set apart as sacred. It's talking about a building. It's talking about a public worship. It's talking about clergy. It's talking about all these things that have to do with this, you know, this place. Now, like I just said a little while ago, we bought a, a building, and man, I'm excited about it. We need buildings. We need the church, but that's not what Jesus was talking about. He wasn't saying, I'm going to come and build a building. He wasn't saying, I'm going to come and, and build a cathedral. Because none of this, what we just read about church, actually relates to the word ecclesia. It has nothing to do with what Jesus wanted to build. Instead of of trying to build a gathering, though, we end up building a place. And Jesus, he came to build a movement, not a monument. Jesus came to build a movement. He he wasn't coming so that we could just have these nice buildings that we could gather in. He was coming to build a movement, a gathering, a congregation. Well, in the 1500s, a man named William Tyndale was the first one to translate that word ecclesia into the English and not use the word church. He used the word congregation. So that verse would have said, you know, and on this rock I will build my congregation and the powers of hell will not conquer it. And and that kind of makes more sense. Like, oh, a congregation, a group of people gathered together for a similar purpose. Guess what happened? His Bible was outlawed. They arrested him as a heretic and they burned him at the stake. Because he, mistran- he didn't mistranslate, he translated it accurately. But the, the powers that be didn't want that. They wanted to preserve that word church because in preserving that, it preserved a certain amount of power. You have to come to this place. The word ecclesia is used 116 times in the New Testament. And all, all but three times. It's translated as the word church. In fact, King James, when he commissioned the King James Bible in the 1600s, he specifically laid out all of these rules for how to translate the Bible. And one of the rules that he said, listen to this, he said the word church must not be translated congregation. It must not be, tra- it needs to stay church. Because what is church? Church is a building. And they were building buildings. They were building, you know, these, these great cathedrals, these spectacular buildings. And we don't want to undermine what we're doing with our architecture. We don't want to confuse the people. Well, it was not only was it uh, a, a bad substitution, we see that they actually were doing this on purpose. So, anyhow, this word has gotten certainly a, a, a whole meaning that, that Jesus didn't intend. He meant a congregation, a gathering. Now, after this conversation, Jesus, of course, we know, he, he came in to Jerusalem. Like we're celebrating today on Palm Sunday. He came in riding on a donkey. He was getting ready for his last few days on earth. At that point in time, he was arrested. He was crucified. They buried him. And all of his followers, they split. 
Nobody believed anymore. Nobody believed because everything that Jesus said was so much about himself. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I can forgive. I am the Son of God. All, it was all about him. And when he was dead, the movement died too. There was no gathering. There was no congregation. There was no church. There was nothing because he was dead and gone. But we read in Scripture and we believe that three days later, he rose from the dead. And after he rose from the dead, he actually began appearing to his followers. And those, those followers, man, something changed inside of them. The, these, these people, John who ran, and Peter who betrayed Jesus, and all the disciples who abandoned him in his death were now out in the streets preaching. And, and after several weeks, Jesus gathers all of his followers together on a mountaintop. And we're going to read in Matthew 28. So they're all gathered together. And Jesus came and told them, Matthew 28, 18, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. That's kind of an arrogant statement, isn't it? If I said, you know what, guys? I've been given all the authority on heaven and on earth. I mean, you want something? Just ask me for it. I will make it happen. I've given all the authority in the whole world and in all of heaven. I mean, you might be like, man, that's kind of a, it's kind of a crazy thing to say. But the disciples look at him and like, you know what, man? We saw you get crucified. We saw you die. In fact, we carried you to the tomb. We saw the stone get rolled and, and now you're talking to us? Okay, you say you got all the authority? I'm going to go with that, okay? He says, I have been given all authority and then he goes and he says, here's how I'm going to use that authority. How would you use all the authority? If you had all the authority in the world, how would you use that authority? Well, here's how he's going to use that authority. Verse 19 says, therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. All the nations, everywhere. How are we going to get there? Just go, just go. But, but we don't even know where all the nations are. Just go, just take off in that direction and keep going. He says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Verse 20. Teach these new disciples to obey the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And then he leaves. It's like, wait a minute. You just said, I'm, you're going to be with us always. And then, and then he's gone. He disappears. He, he's, he's gone. He says, I will be with you always. Well, his followers, these that were formerly cowards, they now begin to go into the streets. They begin to go out there preaching. We talked about this last week. They weren't preaching the parables that Jesus said. They weren't preaching the miracles that Jesus did. They weren't preaching even his greatest teachings, the Sermon on the Mount. They weren't preaching that. They had a four-point sermon, and, and it's in your notes. It says, you've killed him. Yeah, you, you people here. You know, they were looking at the very people that were responsible for Jesus' death. You've killed him. God raised him. We've seen him. Now you say you're sorry. You say you're sorry. And that's the message that they were preaching. It was simple. Hey, Jesus died. Everybody around here knows Jesus died. And we saw him back to life again. Now say you're sorry. And in Acts 2.47... It says, and each day they added to their fellowship those who are being saved. Who added? The Lord added. You know, and so many times, you know, churches, they, 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 they struggle and they try to say, oh, how, what do we have to do to add more people? Here it's saying, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved, those who were deciding to follow Christ, those who were going to take faith. And the Jesus movement was now born. And we see thousands of people in Jerusalem begin to follow him, begin to believe. They become disciples. And the, the church, as we, as we know it, as a gathering, as this congregation, as this ecclesia, began to grow and grow. Not because of teaching, but because of an event. That event being the resurrection of Christ. So for two years, this is going on. It's growing. People are coming to faith. It's growing. Things are going good. And then it stalls. 
it slows down for some reason. There was persecution that hit the church. People were now, now saying, if you're going to believe in this, this new thing, we're going to imprison you, we're going to torture you, we're going to kill you. And it stalled the whole movement. And then there was another problem. These disciples, Jesus said, go into all the nations. They were like going into all the neighborhoods. They weren't quite going far enough. They're going down the road. They're they're talking to God in all these areas, but they're not going into the nations. Because see, and God is saying, you know, this isn't just for the Jews. I think you maybe misunderstood that. It's not just for the Jews. So, through that, God raised up another person. Like, who can we raise up now? This man named Saul. Saul, who who was somebody that was chasing down Christians and imprisoning them. Saul, now God appears to him and says, Saul, you are going to, you're going to be a spokesperson. And and I want you to go into all the nations. And Saul, his name was changed to Paul. He comes and he meets the leaders in Jerusalem. And this is the deal they worked out. He's like, you guys take all of Jerusalem and I'll take everything else. Here goes Paul. 30 years of his life, traveling, traveling the known world as far as he could go, traveling, teaching, preaching, that God did something, that Jesus was raised from the dead. 30 years. And then when Paul was in his 60s, he was arrested. Arrested, thrown in prison. And here he is in prison at the time of Nero. Right, we know Nero, one of the, the, the worst emperors ever. I mean, this person, I mean, he, he, would, he would torture people. He would, you know, put people on stakes and light them on fire to light his dinner parties. I mean, this was a horrible person. And, and I wonder if Paul, ever sitting in that jail cell, said, I wonder if this is actually going to work. Like, like, like the... Here we are preaching this, and the Roman Empire is just getting stronger and stronger and stronger. They're getting more and more violent. And man, I I know Jesus said he wants to build this thing, but I wonder if it's actually going to work. How can it survive the Roman Empire? And it would be interesting if, if, if we could have had a conversation with Paul. You know, the evening before he was let off, for his execution. It would have been interesting to say, Paul, look around. You see this city of Rome that you're in? One day, for many people that follow Jesus, this will be the city that they call their headquarters. And and, and you see the Colosseum, where there were so many of of followers of Christ have died. They'll actually hang a cross there in memory of those that gave their lives. And and Paul, there will come a day where, where there will be, be buildings that are built for the, for the purpose of people gathering together. There will be hundreds of thousands, millions of people that will come to faith. And, and, and this whole Roman Empire, it won't even be around anymore. But there will be a gathering. There will be an ecclesia of believers in every major city of the world. And you know all these letters that you've been writing to little churches around? They survived. We don't know how, but they survived. They survived thousands of years, and we still read those even now. And you know Caesar Augustus, the one who seemed so so powerful, he was like claiming that he was God? They'll mention him one time a year. And when they mention the name Caesar Augustus, it's simply as a side note to the birth of Jesus Christ. And they don't remember anything that Caesar did, but they remember the birth of Jesus. And in Matthew 16, at the end of that verse 18, man, to reflect on Jesus saying, I will build my church. I will build this ecclesia, not just a building, not just a place where we can go and it's got, you know, things that remind us of God. No, I will build a gathering. I will build a congregation. And all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Nothing is going to stop 
stop this. Nothing can stop us. Nothing can hold us back. Man, the, 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 all the powers of hell can come against us, but nothing is going to hold us back. When I was getting ready to start Thrive, somebody said, what makes you think that you can build a life-giving church? And I thought about it, and I probably answered something stupid. But after, when I thought about it, I said, I can't. I can't do it. There's nothing I can do to do it because Jesus, He will be the one that builds His church. And the powers of hell can't stand uh, against it. You know, for me, it's more of me just trying to get out of the way and not screw things up along the way. I mean, like, I hope I don't, I don't, you know, turn people away because I know you want them to come. You want to build your church. But here's the thing. You have been invited. You have been invited to be a part of God's activity here on earth. Jesus says, I've been given all power, all authority, and here's what I want you to do. Go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. And through compassion and through interaction with with the church, with this local body of believers... Now, I agree the church has not always gotten it right. But even with all that, even with all the mistakes, even with all the things, man, it is still growing at an amazing way. Why? Because there's no person that can take credit for it. Jesus says, I'm going to build my church. Ephesians 5.31. I always thought this was an interesting verse. It says, the scriptures say, A man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Verse 32 says, This is a great mystery, but it is what? An illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So marriage between a husband and wife is an illustration of Jesus Christ and the church. We are the church. The church is the bride of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. And as it says here... I'll be one. The two shall be one. But it's an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. Now, now that's just kind of setting up this next scripture I'm going to read here. Luke 19, verse 10 says, For the Son of Man to seek and save those who are lost. And, and, and I, I've, I've talked with other, other pastors, and there's one thing, if you want to get me mad... <laughs> It's, it's about this, because there's, there's sometimes people out there believe that, oh, what we need to do is just gather, we huddle around together, and we sing a few songs, and we tell the rest of the world to go to hell. And, and, and the reality is, he's saying, the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. And if, and if the church is the bride of Christ, and we are supposed to be one, then should not our main primary function be to seek and save the lost as well? To make disciples of all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Should not that be our number one priority as well? Our our priority here at Thrive Church is not to go and buy a building. Yeah, it's great. I'm excited that we have a building. But that's not the reason why we exist. We exist to reach out to other people and tell them that something happened. That Jesus is alive. And you know what? It actually relates to our lives. It's not just some some religious mumbo-jumbo that we go to feel good about ourselves, maybe. It's something that's actually practical and relates. So if Jesus came to seek and save the lost, shouldn't that also be the mission of the church? You know, our our mission statement here at at Thrive is simple. It's, It's right there in your notes. To make fully devoted followers of Christ. That's it. We want to make fully devoted followers of Christ. I don't care where you are. Man, you might hate God. Well, that's our goal. We want to get you to hate him less, you know? And, and you might be saying, oh, I've been a Christian for 49 years. Well, that's great. We want you to, to, to love him a little bit more and move a little bit more in that direction. We want to help you to become fully devoted followers of Christ. We want to be a place where people can come in and feel welcome, feel loved. Man, last night, I went out to eat with uh, John and Michaela. <laughs> and after we ate, we're like, we're eating dinner, we're talking, we're having a good time. And then, and then the restaurant manager comes over, and he's standing like, like, what, five feet away from us? Five, and it's like his arms crossed, like looking at us. 
We're like, what in the world is this guy doing? And he's just standing there, standing there. And then he walks away, and then he comes back, and he walks away, and he comes back. And apparently we were taking too long in the restaurant. And they wanted us to get moving. And, uh, and, and I mean, yeah, granted, they had a long line out there and whatever. I, I'm not saying he wasn't right in what he did. But, man, I didn't feel welcome. We left, and we're like, man, like the food was good, but I kind of don't want to go back there again because I didn't feel welcome. And, and that's what our, our goal is. We want to make a place where people feel welcome. Man, come in with your messes. Don't clean up yourself. Just come in, and we want to make you feel welcome. So what's the next step? What's the next step for you? I'm not sure what your next step is, but maybe... Your next step is simply to say, you know, I'm just going to continue to come and attend and listen. I don't even fully believe yet, but I want to learn more about it a little bit. Or, or maybe for you would say, you know, it's time for me to put my faith in Christ. It's time for me to say, you know what, I am going to commit myself to this. Maybe for some of you is to say, you know what, I need to get involved with community. I need to get involved with a, a, a group of believers that we can do life together. And, and you can talk to us, talk to us at the desk. We have some groups that meet, and if, and if there's not one that you like, then, then start your own, man. We, we want groups to meet. You might just find a friend and say, hey, let, let's, let's get together, you know. At the bottom of your sheet, every week, questions. You can just, like, ask each other questions and just say, you know, what, what does this mean? How, how do we really apply this in our lives? Maybe that's the next step. Maybe the next step for you is to serve. Man, imagine that. So when we volunteer in the local church, we are partnering with millions of people across the world, serving in an organization that is thousands of years old for the express reason of not just entertaining ourselves, but we're reaching people with the kingdom of God. Maybe for you it's saying, you know, it's time for me to start giving, to contribute financially. And, and I think giving is even a bad word. I, I like to look at it more as investing. You know, what, what better investment than to invest into the kingdom of God? So, you know, I'm going to invest my resources into helping God's word get preached in this area and to help people become discipled and grow in their relationship. I don't know what your next step is. But I, here's what I do believe. Bill Bible said this. He said the local church is the hope of the world. And I believe that with all my heart. The local church is the hope of the world. The church addresses the three problems that every person faces, the three biggest concerns, which is sin, sorrow, and death. And it addresses all of those things in an amazing way. And you are invited to participate. It's not an exclusive club. I know some people say, well, I went to church, and I just never fit in. I just never could get involved. And they didn't like, you know, my tattoo or something, you know. We don't care. Like, like we, we, we like your tattoos. You know, come, get involved. <laughs> and you've been invited to participate in spreading this good news, to bring this message of hope to every corner of the world. That's what we talked about, you know, this, uh, this ranger thing, this, this scouting program for, the, for the boys and girls. That's our purpose with that is, man, to reach kids with the good news and us as adults to grow in our own faith as, uh, as a result of it. Man, what a great opportunity to reach out to kids and say, hey, you know, here's, some, here's how to build a fire, but here's some things that are going to help you in your life and in your faith. We're going to close with this verse, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. This is God has put all things under the authority of Christ. He said that. He said, he said, I've been given all authority. All things are under his authority. And he's made him the head over all things for the benefit of who? Of the church. It's the most important thing. And this church is his body. We are the body of Christ. It's made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. The church is God's plan A. And guess what? There's no plan B. There's no, so some people say, oh, I just don't like the church. I've just been burned by the church. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about an experience that you've had that you didn't like. I'm sorry that sometimes people hurt you. I'm sorry about all this. But, but, but Jesus, I'm going to build this ecclesia. I'm going to build this gathering. And all the powers of hell can't come against it. So even if we've had bad experiences, we need to say, you know, I need to put that aside for a moment and realize that God is inviting me to be a part of his organization, to play a role in reaching people. 
And this, this group, this gathering, this congregation, us here at Thrive, we have three focuses. Three directions, it's easy to remember. First direction is up. Meaning that, man, we value our relationship with God. And we need to be connecting with God on a daily basis. The next is, is, is inward. We need to be growing in our own faith, but also inward as a church, getting together, having community, getting together with other people, going out for coffee, doing things like that. And then the last direction, we got up and, and then outward. I mean, it's not just about us, though. We're here to seek and save the lost. So I, I encourage you. Yeah, put your faith in Christ. But, but let's not let it just stop there. I want to encourage you to engage and to be a part of what God is doing here on this earth. What God is doing here in Connecticut and in New England and in Litchfield County and in Thomaston and Terryville and Plymouth and all these surrounding areas. Man, when we started a church, I, you wouldn't believe, people say, you can't start a church in Connecticut. People don't want to go to church. I'm like, I, that just seems like the people we need to be reaching though. If anybody needs it, it's the people that aren't going. Why would I want to go and reach people that are church? But God is, he, he's inviting us and encouraging us to be a part to engage, we have the opportunity to partner with our Heavenly Father to change not only our communities, but the world. I would encourage you to take the next step. For some of you, that next step might even be further. Saying, you know, I feel like God is, is calling me into even a higher level of serving that I give my life to serve on in full-time ministry, on a mission field. Man, if you feel God's calling you to take the next step, take the next step. You will never, ever regret it. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you. And we thank you for coming to this earth and for building your church. Not a building, not a cathedral, but this ecclesia, this gathering, this congregation. We thank you for building this. And you said the powers of hell can't stand against it. And we thank you for inviting us play a part in that if you're here and you've never made that you know decision to follow maybe maybe you're at a point in your life where you thought you were following me say you know what i just i just need a reboot i need a restart i need a reset god's word says if you believe in your heart jesus is lord and you confess that with your mouth that jesus is lord that you are saved and i would say take that step today Take that step. Confess that Jesus is Lord. And then let's partner together to reach people with this good news. Lord, we thank you for all you've been doing in our own lives and in our relationships and in this local gathering of believers and seekers and explorers Help us never to lose sight of what your passion is to seek and save those that are far from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.